Hi there, this is Manuel with another Houdini tutorial. Today I want to look into plant growth. Especially I want to have a look at the connection between plant growth and mathematics. Have you ever looked at a flower head like this one in this image here? You see that the seeds are distributed in a very distinct pattern. They form spirals, spiraling outwards from the center. And they are closely packed, making use of all the space available to them. This pattern is special. It is called phyllotaxis, and it emerges due to the special angle that is used to place successive seeds. So if you measure the angle between two successive seeds, you will find that it is roughly 137.5 degrees. And this is a special angle known as the golden angle, usually denoted as phi. If you use this angle to distribute the seeds, you end up with a pattern where the seeds are closely packed, using all the space without gaps. And this property makes it so special. To study this a little further, I built a simple philotactic model inside of Houdini. Here you have it, and you see the distribution is quite similar to the photo that we had. At the moment, I'm starting at the center of this disk, and then I'm rotating each successive seed by the golden angle, and move it outwards a little bit. But to understand what makes phi so special as an angle, let's turn off disk. Now all the seeds, or organs as they are called in the paper, are placed on a circle. Now watch what happens if I start to add organs. I place my first seed here, and then the second one is rotated by 137.5 degrees, it's placed over there. And the next one ends up here, and the fourth ends up there, and the fifth there. And if you watch this process, you see that by using this angle we make sure that each successive seed is always placed in the gap that exists between the seeds that are already there. The golden angle makes sure that the distribution of these organs is optimal. That is not true for different angles. So look what happens if I use a different angle. So if I just change this, I get something like this. Now I have 122 degrees and I get a very regular pattern that easily overlaps. No matter what angle I use here, nothing is as optimal as the golden angle, 137.5 degrees. But now let's have a look what happens in the disk. It's the same story, it's just that I now start from the origin and move the organs outwards when placing them. And you see by doing so, this pattern emerges. And again, if I mess with the angle, everything breaks down you get strange spirals, but the optimal packing is gone. So the angle 137.5 is special. I implemented phyllotaxis, but the problem is this is a very, very simple disk model. So everything is spaced on a flat disk. And that is not true in reality. In reality, these flower heads usually have a three-dimensional form to them. And that is why I don't want to just use this model. I want to go a little bit more complicated. I want to place these seeds on a surface of revolution. So how can this be done? This question is answered by a paper that I found. This paper, The Use of Positional Information in the Modeling of Plants, by Pruzinkiewicz and colleagues. And this paper talks a lot about all different aspects of plant growth, but if you scroll down to section 7, it talks about compact philotactic patterns in a lot of detail. First they outline how to create this disk pattern that I just showed you, and down here is what interests us. So instead of just creating a flat disk, we want to use a surface of revolution and then put the organs on this surface of revolution to model a flower head like this one. They even provide some pseudocode that we can use to understand the algorithm. But before we go into Houdini and start implementing this, let's think about what this paper is actually telling us. I copied the relevant section of the paper here as a reference, but don't look at it too closely because it's just some complicated math. Instead, let's try to get a little intuition on what they are telling us to do. So first, they tell us to define a curve called C, and this curve should be the function f of s. This means the function f of the parameter s, and s is just the arc length, so the length of the curve up to a certain point on the curve, should return a point in Cartesian space. So if we draw a curve C, this is our curve C, it has its origin down here, and say we pick this point here, then this point is a certain distance from the origin, and this distance is called S0, say. So then this point is F of S0, and it returns the Cartesian point and Cartesian coordinates that sits on the curve. But we don't want to stop here. A curve is not enough. We need a surface. 
So let's first define a coordinate space by introducing a y and the x axis, y and x, and let's rotate our curve around this y axis to form a surface of revolution, like this. And in my case, this gives this barrel shape. Now we can start placing organs on the surface. Each successive organ will be rotated 137.5 degrees around the Y, just as in the disk case. The problem that we have to solve is how far to move the next organ up the curve to avoid intersections. And to solve this puzzle, they are looking at the surface area. So imagine we have an organ. This organ covers a certain surface area if it's placed on this surface, and this surface area will be circular. So let's call the area AO for the area of the organ. Now, we want to find out how far we have to travel along this curve until the area between the origin down here and a point on the curve, traced out by rotating this segment of the curve around the y-axis, is large enough to accommodate one of the organs. And how do we do that? We look at the problem piecewise. So let's first consider a little patch of area down at the origin. So that will be here. And then we take a small step delta s in the direction of the curve. And this traces out an area, like so. So we are looking at this area down here. And we give it a name, let's call it A, S, and then 1, because here we have S1. Now we can calculate this area by using a formula, and now we can create a ratio between this area and the area covered by one of the organs. So let's form this ratio. Let's just calculate A, S1, so this first slice of area, over A, O. This now tells us how the two areas relate. Let's take a practical example. If this area happens to be, say, 1, and if the area covered by one of the organs happens to be 2, then this quantity will be 1 half. And 1 half will tell us that no organ fits in this area. This area is half of the area of one organ. That means we are not placing any organ, instead we are considering the next slice of area. So we are moving up the curve to a location here called S2, and again we have a little delta S, and we are looking at the next slice of area. Now we are taking this slice of area, AS2, and divide it by the area of one of the organs, giving us this ratio, and now we add the two quantities up. And if we assume that this slice of area here is the same as the first slice in our case, we have again 1 over 2, so again 1 half, and if we add this together, we now know that from 0 to S2, we now have an area with a ratio of 1 that is capable of hosting exactly one organ. So as soon as the integer part of the sum is incremented by 1, we know that one more organ can be placed. And that means that we now can place our first organ. And where do we place it? Well, we place it at the point S2, here. That will be our first organ. And now we again consider another slice of area by going up and then considering the next slice of area, which will be this one. And of course I'm exaggerating here. In reality, these slices are a lot more tiny. And we add this, which is S3. So we add this to the sum area of S3 over the area of an organ and if we assume that this again will be 1 over 2, we have 1 over 2 here. And now the sum is 3 halves, meaning no organ can be placed because the integer part is not incremented by 1. But if we do it again, so another plus here and another slice of area here, this time is 4. This slice here. Now we add a of s4 over a0, and if we assume that this again is 1 over 2, 
Then we reach again a point where the whole sum is 2, meaning the integer part is now incremented by 1, and we know that we can place our next organ. And where do we place it? Well, first we rotate it around the y-axis 137.5 degrees. For the y component we use the point S4, which is there. So we put the organ somewhere here around the circle, like there, for example. And if we continue this process, if we add up the area of this surface of revolution until it is large enough to accommodate another organ and then place the organ, we can pack the entire surface with organs. If we reach the end of the curve, we eventually will have placed enough organs such that the area covered by the organs is roughly the same as the surface area of the surface of revolution. And that is exactly what is written down here. So what they just defined here is a function called n, and n means how many organs are placed. To calculate this, they define an integral from 0 to s, so to a certain point along the curve, and then they form this ratio here. And this ratio is really nothing but what I outlined over there, the upper part, this here, the so 2 pi fx of s times ds, is the area of an infinitesimally small slice of the surface of revolution. The formula down there, pi p squared of s, is the area of one of the organs. So this is exactly this ratio here, and the integral means sum it all up until you reach s. This will spit out a number, and the integer part of the result will tell us how many organs can be placed in this surface area. And the y value can be derived from just calculating this one slice at a time and then placing an organ whenever the integer part of this number of this result here is incremented by exactly one. So at one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So let's switch to Houdini now and implement this. So this is Houdini and let's start by dropping a geonode as always and let's call this geonode Philotaxis. Let me move the parameters out of the way a little bit. Like so, let's call this Philotaxis, and let's dive into this object. To start, we want to define a curve. So let's switch to the front viewport, because now we are looking at the xy plane, and let's drop down a curve node. A curve node, and then press return of the viewport, that allows you to start drawing a curve, and I will just quickly outline a curve here, something like this. So that will be our curve that we want to use to create the surface of revolution. Now we can switch back to the perspective viewport, here is our curve, but of course the curve is linear and I could in theory switch over to NURBS or Bezier, but I don't want to do that, I want to just subdivide this polygonal curve by using a subdivide node. So let's add a subdivision node. And let's subdivide this three times, which gives us a smooth curve. This is just one primitive. If I turn on primitive numbers, you see this is primitive zero. Now, before we start implementing our wrangle, let's first calculate the perimeter or the length of this curve as we will need it later. To do that, we want to use a measure sop. So append a measure sop here, make it visible, and then switch from area to perimeter. And this will happily add an attribute called perimeter. Let's quickly check if this is actually the case. And here we have the perimeter. Our curve is 1.67 units long. So now it's time to create our wrangle to create the points to distribute our organs. But we don't want to replace the geometry of the curve. Instead, we want to create new points. So the way you do this is first you add a wrangle. Wrangle. Let's use the point wrangle. We want to switch this over later. And then to make this execute, we just need a null to connect it to the first input, because without a first input, this will not execute. And then we want to feed the curve to the second input. We will use the data from the curve, but the points should be created in this geometry stream. So make it visible and call it swept taxes, like so. And now very important, our algorithm will contain a loop. 
to be precise, two while loops. We cannot run over points as there are no points. Instead, let's switch the run over dropdown to detail only once. Now with this in place, let's directly append the structure that will visualize our points. So let's add a sphere, just a standard sphere. Here you have it, it has a radius of one, so a standard unit sphere. And then let's use a copy to points. And let's copy this sphere to the points that we are about to create. Of course, at the moment there will be no spheres copied because we do not have points yet, but this will change in a second. So with this setup in place, let's start implementing our swept fill taxes operator. Let's activate the swept fill taxes, then go over here in the expression field and press Alt E on Windows at least to open up the code editor, like so. So let's think about what we will need. Well, the very first thing that we have to define is the size of an organ. Let's go float and let's call it P as they call it P in the paper. And that will be the channel. And I would call it organ size like this. So this will give us the organ size. Apply this. And now to create this channel as an input field, press this little button here and it will show up here. And let's use 0.05 as organ size for now. The next quantity that is important to our little program is the length of the curve that is coming in. And remember the curve is coming in over the input port two, so it's the second input. So let's define a float, call it L as in the paper, and let's use a prim function to read the primitive attribute from this one primitive that comes in there. And we want to read from geometry stream one. The attribute to read is called perimeter, like this. And then we want to read the first component, like that. That will give us the perimeter that we calculated with the measure sop. Next, we want to define the step length, because we are intending to go piecewise over the surface of this area of revolution. So we need a step length, delta s. So let's define a float, delta s. And for now, let's just set it to 0 0.001. If you decrease this value, then the precision will be higher, but it will take more steps and take longer to execute. Then let's do some forward declarations. Forward declarations. So let's just create some variables that we will use inside of the loop, as it is not good practice to define variables inside of the loop. So first, we want to create a float float, call it A for the area that we want to hold and initialize it with zero. Then we will need a float S. Remember, this is the arc length parameter that we will need to sample the curve. And this will be zero two for now. And then we need a float X. That is the X component of the Cartesian point on the curve, zero and a float, you guessed it, y for the y component of the Cartesian point that we are about to create. Then it might be a good idea to specify another float. And let's call this float phi, which is the golden angle. And let's set it to 137.5 degrees. But as rotations inside of Houdini work with radians, let's directly convert this number to radians by using the radians function. Now we are pretty much all set. We can start to write our loop. First, we want to define a loop that places organs as long as we did not reach the length of the curve. So the first loop that we want to write is a while loop, so while, and the condition will be s is smaller than l. That means the arc length that we are currently looking at will be smaller than the length of the entire curve. As long as this is the case, the entire thing should continue executing and should try to place new organs. So parentheses, like so. And now inside of this first while loop, we want to define the second while loop. Because remember, we want to accumulate the area until the integer part reaches one or two or three. So another loop is needed to accumulate the area. So let's write another while loop while now the condition will be a the area is smaller than one. And at the same time, just as a safeguard, s is smaller than l. So as long as the area that we are accumulating is smaller than one, we want to go on adding up area patches. Parentheses again, like so. And now let's see. 
the very first thing that we want to do is we want to calculate the area of this tiny patch of surface of this surface of revolution. So we first have to pick a point and sample the point position to get the x and y coordinates. To do this, we want to use a function, a vex function called prim uv, because we can then just use a uv coordinate, and in the case of a curve, we just have a u value that is going along the primitive, and we can sample an attribute from this uv location. To use this, we first have to transform our singular parameter u, in our case this is s, the arc length, into a vector, because the prim uv function is not only meant for curves, but for surfaces, and it expects a vector. So let's create a vector uv and set it to s, which is the arc length, and then for the second component v, zero. We are not using this. And now that we use uv, we shouldn't forget to define the uv variable beforehand. So let's do this here, vector, and in our case this is a vector 2, uv, and we can set it to be 0, like so, 0, 0. So now this is our uv vector, and here it gets filled with the parameter s that we are using, and s starts at 0. And now, with this in place, we can sample the curve. So we can define a new variable, let's call pause, which will be the Cartesian point. This pause should be prim uv, the function that is used to sample any attribute from a primitive at a uv location. And inside of this parameter space, we want to specify one for the geometry stream, as we intend to sample the curve that is incoming over port one. Then we have to specify the attribute that we want to sample, and we are interested in p, the Cartesian coordinate. Now we want to give it the ID of the primitive that we are intending to sample, that is zero, we just have one curve as an input. And last but not least, we have to give it the UV location. And as we set it to this uv variable, let's just put uv here. Now this will sample our curve at the position, at the parametric position uv, and return the Cartesian coordinate p and save it to pause. Again, don't forget to create the variable pause vector, 3D vector, pause, and let's initialize it to be zero, just as before with the uv, zero, zero, zero. So now we have created a pause variable and we are filling it with the result of this prim uv function. But there is a little problem here, and that problem has to do with the parameter space used by Houdini. Houdini defaults to use a natural parameterization on curves, and that means that the parameter u is going from 0 to 1 over the length of the curve. So if I sample at u0, I will get the point at the origin of the curve, and if I sample u1, I will get the last point of the curve. In our case, that is not what we intend. Instead, we want to sample by arc length. So we want to specify s being a length traveled along the curve. So we first, before we use prim uv, have to convert this s parameter from being a natural parameterization or a natural parameter to an arc length parameter. Fortunately, there is a function for this in the VEX SDK or in the VEX API, and this function is called primuvconvert. So let's quickly have a look at the help card for this function, primuvconvert. And as you can see, it will take in a vector 2 uv and will spit out a vector 2 converted to a different parameter space. And you have to set the mode with this integer here, and the modes are listed here. So there are 11 modes. We have modes with strange names like Premier V, Real to Unit, and Real to Unit LAN, and stuff like this. And here it gives a little explanation. So the real domain is based on the number of curve segments, 0 to n segments. A segment can hold multiple control points based on the curve degree. And in, a, in case of our curve, we just have one segment. Unit domain is the real domain normalized to fit 0 to 1. That is a standard. Unit len domain maps the curve based on its length but normalized 0 to 1, and len domain maps the curve based on its length, 0 to curve length. So that is probably what we need. The prim uv function, as I already told you, is expecting a parameter u in the unit domain. 
so it expects this parameter to be between 0 and 1, 0 being the start of the curve and 1 being the end of the curve. And we have a parameter in the len domain, because our parameter s is supposed to be the arc length between 0 and the curve length. The mode that we want to use is primuv len to unit, because then we treat the parameter that we are passing the function as len, and we convert it to unit, and unit is exactly what the primuv function is expecting. So the value we want to use is 10. Let's do this now. uv will be overwritten by the function primuv convert, and this function is defined as follows. We have to pass on the curve, then the parameter that we want to change, uv, and then again the primitive number 0, and last but not least the mode, and as we saw earlier, the mode will be 10. So this converts our parameter from being an arc length parameter to being a unit parameter such that the prim uv function can understand it and returns the correct answer. Pause will now be filled with the position along the curve. But we are not interested in the entire position, we are interested in the x component of this position, because the x component is used to calculate the area. So let's use x and let's set it to the first component of the position vector, pause zero. That is just for convenience, because I of course could write pause brackets zero all the time, but writing x is easier, like that. And now it's time to calculate the area. The area, as we can see in the paper, should be the area from the previous calculation, a, plus the area of the currently processed slice. And this area is, let's quickly look at the paper again to remind ourselves about the formula. Here we have it. So the area up here is 2f of x s, and the area down there is p squared s, after we get, got rid of the pi because it is in the numerator and the denominator. So with this in mind, let's just write this down here. So this will be 2 times x over the power of p comma 2, so p squared, and all of this multiplied by delta x, like so. So x is already the x component of the curve function, because we sampled the curve here. Primuv serves as the curve function f of s, and returns a value x and y, and then we extract x, and that means that fx of s is just x in our case. So we multiply this by 2 and then divide it by p squared. And all of this business goes times delta x. Let's again quickly check if this is exact what is written here. So 2 times fx of s, which is x in our example, divided by p squared s. And p squared s just means that we can vary the value for p with different s's. So whenever we have a different parameter s, we could use a different p. That is why it's written as a function here. But we are using a constant p. We just define p to be one organ size throughout the entire calculation. That is why this simplifies to p to the power 2. And then all of this times delta x. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake here. Delta s, of course. That is our step size. So now we are adding to the sum of the area one tiny ratio between two areas, just as we saw in the theory section. And after that we have to increment the parameter s, because in the next execution of the loop we want to look at the next surface area patch. So s will be s plus delta s. Now this loop will run as long as a is smaller than 1. And as soon as this reaches 1, it will stop running, and then we can do something and create an organ. Because as soon as this A reaches 1, we know that we have enough area to place an organ. So that means we leave the loop now, and we care about creating an organ after the loop. But before we do that, let's indent this properly to make it more readable. So let's indent this. Like so. The first thing we want to do is to deviate a little bit from the mathematical description of this, because algorithmically it's easier to always check for a being smaller than 1. 
So instead of checking for the integer part, just crossing a whole number, we can do that by just subtracting one from a after the fact. So if we write now a is a minus one, we are decrementing a by one, and that means it starts over with the next uh, iteration and then again accumulates up to one, and we can use the same loop. So that's just a little algorithmic trick. And now we want to add a point. So let's create a new integer int n p and t for the new point, and let's add a point. And where should we add this point? It goes in geometry stream zero and should be added just as to pause. Because after this whole loop, pause will be the last point on the curve that we were looking at. So that is exactly the point where we want to place the organ. And that is why we can just write pause here. And we create the point at pause. But wait a second, this now moves the point to the correct location on the curve. But we totally forgot about rotating it around the y-axis by phi. So let's rotate the pause point before we use to create a real geometry point. To do that, we will need a matrix three. So before everything, let's define a matrix three, matrix three, and let's call it M and let's set it to the identity by using the ident function like so. And now we can use this matrix to rotate our pause variable before we use it to create the point. So let's first define a y component to be pause one, and then we want to get rid of the third component of the z component if it exists. So let's write pause is set to set a new vector x comma y comma zero, like so. So now we make sure that we do not have a z component if we accidentally drew a curve that has a z component. That's just a safeguard. And now we can again initialize our matrix. M is ident, just to make sure that we always start with a clean matrix, like so. And now we want to use the rotate function. So rotate, set the matrix M to reflect to be a rotation matrix. And now we want to rotate by phi. And we want to set the axis by just using set to be the y-axis 0, 1, 0. So that is the axis that this rotate function should use. Now the problem is we don't want to rotate by phi, but we want to rotate by phi as often as the index number of the organ that we are just placing. But we don't have a count variable, so we don't know the index of the organ we are just placing. So we don't know how often we created an organ yet. So let's account for this by just counting the times that we created a point. For this, let's introduce a new variable, integer i, and set it to zero. That is just how many points we added. And after everything, after we added the point, let's just call i++ plus plus to increment i by one. That means that now inside of the loop, we will have a counting variable that tells us how often we created a point and thus the index number of the point. And we can use this to multiply phi to rotate as often by phi as the index number tells us. And again, let's indent all of this business properly to make it more readable. So now we set the matrix to be a rotation. The last thing that we have to do is now to update the pause variable by just multiplying it by the matrix, or the other way around, the matrix by pause. And that will apply the rotation to the position vector. And now we use this position vector to add the point. And the very last thing that we want to do now, basically we just implemented everything that we need, the very last thing that we want to do now is to set the organ size. Because remember, we used here a unit sphere of radius one. Of course, we could manually set this to be the same as our organ size, but that would be cumbersome. So why not just writing p scale 0.05 to the points and then the copy to points will take care of scaling the spheres accordingly. So before we increment i, let's just add another line and let's set a point attribute set point attrib 
like so. The point is in geometry stream zero, the attribute to set is p scale. The ID of the point is n, p, and t. The value to set is p, because p is our organ size. And then we have to specify that the function should set the attribute like this. And now, if everything went right, we should have a working Philotaxis operator. Chances are that I made a lot of typos, but let's see what happens if I press apply. And you see, we get an error here telling us that we have one bracket too much. Let's do this now, that was not correct. I have to fix it here. So here we have one bracket too much. That was not the error. I had the problem with delta s, delta, yeah, because I misspelled it. I wrote delta s, delta s, apply, and you see it is working. So we just implemented the philotaxis operator. As you can see, it beautifully packs these spheres on the surface of revolution. And of course, as everything is procedural, we can go in and change the curve. Let me get rid of the wireframes first, like so. We can change the point of the curve. And because we implemented this as a while loop, huh, remember that the outer loop just says while s is smaller than l, it will always create as many organs as needed to pack the entire surface. So it is totally procedural. We can just click every point of this curve and use it and it will adapt accordingly. And of course, we can go in and change the organ size over here to something else, say 0.2, which will give a very tiny spheres, or 0.8, which will give large spheres. And that gives you a very flexible swept philotaxis operator that you can use to model flower heads or pine cones or pineapples or everything from nature that shows philotactic patterns. And that is quite a bit. So I hope you learned something and as a homework, I advise you to try what happens if you do not use an organ size that is static, like P all the time, but you could try to change P with every iteration. So what happens if you change P with every iteration, then you can distribute organs of different size over the surface of this. So that means we are at the end of this tutorial. Thank you very much for listening. And as always, you can download this file. And to be honest, uh, I will give you the file that includes the disk, philotaxis, and the size function and color and everything. You will find the link in the description. So thanks a lot for listening and see you next time. If you like what we are doing, please consider becoming a Patreon for supporting us and for access to more in-depth courses on topics like volume techniques or PDG or Vellum and more. To everybody who is already supporting us, thank you so much. Without your continuous support, Entangma would not be possible.